So you're here because your teacher made you read James Baldwin's Sonny's Blues. That's okay. I'll help you out as much as I can here on this series we call Simply Lit. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. And if you'd like to donate to my audio career, please do so at my PayPal link in the video description. Also, after listening to the video, feel free to ask me any questions related to your homework that you think I can help with, or any questions that will help you understand the story better. And please feel free to make requests for videos on other literature in the comments. Now please enjoy this brief summary and brief analysis of James Baldwin's Sonny's Blues. Sonny's Blues is a short story written in the first-person singular narrative style. As the story opens, an unnamed narrator reads in a newspaper about the arrest of his brother, Sonny, for using and selling heroin. Breaking news! Harlem heroin has harrowing consequences! The narrator says, I'm too old for this damn shit, just like Danny Glover in the Lethal Weapon series, and tosses the paper aside. The narrator then goes about his day as a math teacher at a school in Harlem, but he's in mild shock the whole day. He can't get his mind off of Sonny. He thinks about all the young lads in his class who don't have the opportunity for bright futures and who are most likely on that treacherous smack, just like his brother Sonny. As he's leaving work, he runs into one of Sonny's old friends. Sonny's friend feels a little responsible for what's happened to Sonny since he is a heroin user himself and is the one who probably got Sonny hooked. I'd feel bad too for getting my buddy hooked on drugs. Sonny's friend also tries to explain to the narrator what it's like to be on drugs and why Sonny may have gotten hooked, but the narrator just ends up more frustrated and angry. Initially, the narrator doesn't write to Sonny, but the narrator finally contacts Sonny because his young daughter, Grace, has died of polio. As President Roosevelt said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself and polio. Sonny writes back and tells the narrator that he really wanted to get in touch with him, but he never contacted him because he felt guilty over the pain he must have caused. Once out of jail, Sonny returns to his Harlem hometown and moves in with the narrator and his wife Isabel. They eat a family dinner, which then turns into a flashback about their parents. Those darn flashbacks always come at dinner time. I mean, let a guy eat flashbacks! The narrator describes his alcoholic dad who died when Sonny was 15. The quiet Sonny didn't get along with their faux tough father who paraded around like a butthead pro wrestler. The narrator then thinks back to the last time he saw his mother alive, just before he went off to the Korean War. She told them the story of how his uncle was murdered by white men who ran him over and how his father was never the same. She asked the narrator to watch over Sonny. The next time he came back to the States was for his mother's funeral. When he came back for the funeral, he had a talk with Sonny. He asked Sonny what he wanted to do with his life. Sonny said he wanted to be a jazz pianist. The narrator thinks being a musician is lame and doesn't think it's good enough for Sonny. No brother of mine is going to be doing acid with the Beatles. They also tried to figure out where Sonny would live for the rest of his high school, and the two brothers argued. Sonny called his brother ignorant for not knowing who the famous jazz musician Charlie Parker is. And that's how I feel when people don't know who Rod Stewart is. I mean, it's Rod frickin' Stewart. Gall. And Sonny doesn't want to finish high school anyway. But Sonny begrudgingly agreed to live with Isabel's parents because there is a piano in their house he can play. When Sonny got home from school, he would always play the piano. However, Sonny became more quiet and withdrawn than ever. Sonny was not going to school, however. Instead, he was going over to Greenwich Village and getting effed up with his jazz friends and doing acid with the Beatles. Once he's found out, Sonny drops out of school and joins the Navy. The brothers both got back from the war and lived in New York for a while. The rare times they see each other, they fight, and so they barely communicate from then on. Only when Gracie died did it seem that the narrator could understand his brother a little better now. Real D-bag move, narrator. The narrative then flashes forward back to the present. After a few weeks, the narrator is home alone and considers searching Sonny's room for signs that he's still on drugs. But he doesn't know that you don't ever touch another man's drugs. But before he's able to get on with his rude search, he notices a street-side religious revival outside his apartment. He watches two women and a man sing and pray, and then he notices that Sonny is standing on the street watching. Both brothers are hypnotized by the woman singing. She kind of sounds like Cher. 
if I could turn back down. After, Sonny heads up to the apartment, and he and the narrator get into an argument. Sonny talks about suffering and about trying to escape it through sexy drugs, and then trying to escape sexy drugs by leaving Harlem. He talks about playing the piano and how he feels the need to play. He tries to explain to his brother why he turned to drugs, but the narrator resists the explanation. The narrator blames that devil jazz music and his jazz friends for leading Sonny to heroin. He tells Sonny how pissed he is that Sonny is an unstable drug addict. Sonny gets angry as well for his brother never reaching out to him after his arrest until way later, for not accepting that people have different ways of dealing with trauma, and for not understanding that being a musician isn't what turned Sonny into a drogadicto. The two eventually chill out, and the narrator realizes that he's really just concerned for his little brother, so he promises himself that he'll keep the promise he made and look after Sonny from now on. Sonny then invites the narrator to come hear him play in Greenwich Village at a club that night. The narrator feels unsure. He's not the jazz club type, he thinks, but he reluctantly agrees. When they get to the jazz club, Creole, the old club band leader, tells Sonny that he's been waiting for him to come back. Lots of people in the club know Sonny and have come to hear him play after his long absence. The narrator realizes how revered and respected Sonny is there and also suddenly realizes that he's in Sonny's world now. Creole then leads Sonny onto the stage. Sonny's piano playing is shaky and unsure at first since he hasn't played for over a year, but after he gets through the first set, he suddenly becomes his old self again, and his magical playing mesmerizes the narrator. Oh hell yeah, Sonny! As the narrator sits at a table by himself, he finally gets what Sonny's been trying to tell him all along, about the dank music, about being a real musician, about trying to deal with that lame-ass suffering. His brother finally understands that it is through music that Sonny is able to turn his suffering into something that has deeper meaning for both him and his audience. You send Sonny a delicious scotch and milk drink. As the waitress puts it on the piano above Sonny's head, he worries that Sonny doesn't see it. But then Sonny takes a drink, nods to the narrator, and goes back to playing. That's some real shit, and they're brothers for real again. Analysis Let's talk about the ending. At the very end of the story, the narrator comes to watch Sonny play piano at the nightclub, and he finally sees his brother as a talented badass. And he also realizes that music is a part of Sonny, and his survival, and his success. As a gesture of this new understanding, the narrator sends Sonny a drink, which he places above him on the piano as he plays. This creates the following image in the last line of the piece. For me, then, as they began to play again, it glowed and shook above my brother's head like the very cup of trembling. The cup of trembling is a biblical reference from the book of Isaiah. And so, literary critics often read the ending of Sonny's blues as a symbol of Sonny's redemption, in this reading, the narrator has truly forgiven Sonny, and Sonny has conquered his drug addiction and redeemed himself, reborn as a functioning musician. Sorry, Beatles, no more acid was your best bud, Sonny. That's it for now, y'all. There's plenty more to analyze in this story than what I've just mentioned. If you have any requests for short stories or poetry summaries and analysis, please let me know in the comments. Wishing you all a good day, and good luck with your homework. Feel free to ask me any questions related to your homework that you think I can help with. Please like and subscribe if you'd be so kind. Stay lit.